Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. While Europe experienced the Middle Ages and waged war in the Crusades, the Korean Peninsula was ruled by the Koryo dynasty, which lasted from 918 to 1392. This era is remembered for the unification of the previous three Korean kingdoms, its pottery, Buddhist wood carvings and movable type technology, yet there is comparatively little popular knowledge about this period's political system and society. To learn more about the Koryo dynasty, we had the privilege of meeting with Professor Remko Bröker, who discussed with us some of the dynasty's characteristics and especially its pluralistic nature. Professor Bröker is Professor of Korean Studies at Leiden University in the Netherlands. He obtained his PhD from the same university and pursued graduate studies there as well as at Seoul National University. He has published on Korean history in various academic journals, translated various modern and historic texts from Korean, and is the author of Establishing a Pluralist Society in Medieval Korea, History, Ideology and Identity in the Koryo Dynasty, which was published in 2010. Professor Remko Bröker, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you. How did you become interested in Korean studies and why did you decide to research Koryo Korea? Well, as for many people, I think, of of my generation, I got interested in Korea through another country. The year when I arrived in Leiden, Korean studies was still very small. I think it had been established as an independent department only the year before. To be honest, I arrived and I did Japanese studies. And while doing so, I became interested in Korea because I realized um, quite quickly, also helped by the atmosphere here in the department, that in order to understand Japanese history, you really need to know something about Korean history. So I decided to uh, take a look at the Korean studies department and um, never left. I'm still there. <laughs> so um, that, that's, that's basically it. I think um, if you want to understand Japanese history, Chinese history, you need to know about Korea. And Korea was always the, the country that was li- left out for a long time. It has changed, I mean, dramatically. I mean, these days no one would think of doing anything with East Asia without looking at Korea, but only 10 or 15 years ago. And especially when I started 25 years ago, um, it was actually the norm to leave out uh, Korea. As for Koryo, there's something very similar there, I think. Because the Koryo dynasty, although it lasted almost 500 years, has always been an under-researched topic, unfortunately. There are good reasons for that. Biggest reason being that the amount of sources we have for Koryo is severely limited. It's in no way comparable to what we have for um, Joseon, which also lasted 500 years. And I was intrigued by um, the few articles in English. I couldn't read Korean at that time, I think. I read about Koryo painted a very different picture of what historical Korea was was like. Very different from Joseon. So it sparked my interest and that's why I um, started studying um, Koryo history. So we want to talk about Koryo today. For those unfamiliar with Korean history, could you give us the three-sentence definition of what Koryo is? The three-sentence definition of what Koryo is? (laughs) You're not making it easy for me. A very long-lived, very diverse extremely crucial period in Korean history in which we saw things that we've never seen before, never seen after, I think, coming together of many different notions, ideas and beliefs and peoples also that have exercised, I think, an enormous influence on whatever came after. That's probably a very bad three sentence definition, but yeah, that's all I can come up with now. To provide some context for our Western listeners, The foundation of the Koryo dynasty coincided with the zenith of the Byzantine Empire. It spawned a period that includes the Crusades, the Mongol invasion of Europe. It is the same era as the one described in the legend of Robin Hood and in books such as Ken Follett's Pillars of the Earth. Should we imagine the Koryo dynasty, therefore, as the Korean equivalent to the high Middle Ages in Europe? That's a very good question, um, and it's it's not one I can easily answer, but there are two things to that. One is providing Kodio, the Kodio period, with some contemporary background, noting that it was flourishing at the same time as the Byzantine Empire was, that Robin Hood was roaming the woods of Nottingham Forest while um, the Kodio rulers were in power. That, that's, I think, very necessary and is often not done. 
uh, to the extent that while you were mentioning this, I was thinking, oh, well, yeah, he's right, of course, that's true. Um, but even someone who works on Kodio like me doesn't do that enough, I think. We don't do it enough. We don't position Korean history in general enough in, in uh, global history. And that's a pity. I think we should. Because it makes much more things clear. And uh, especially for Kodio, um, we seem to have the notion that somehow it was a, well, not a hermit kingdom, uh, probably, but more or less isolated somewhere in the northeast end of the world. In fact, it, it probably wasn't. And if you look at archaeological discoveries, it becomes more and more clear that Kodio, in fact, traded with large parts of the world. With Arab nations, well, that, that has been known for some time, but uh, Central Asia, um, Southeast Asia, East, East Asia, of course, uh, Russia, perhaps even Europe. Um, in, in that sense, it makes perfect sense to compare it to its colleagues, as it were, in, in Europe, um, but also outside of Europe. Um, on the other hand, whether it's, I'm not sure whether it is the Korean equivalent of the European Middle Ages. Um, one, it may be structurally there are similarities, yes. But the, the problem that I keep running into, that's something which anyone who works on Korea and Korean history runs into all the time, is the application of foreign concepts to Korean history and trying to bend Korean history to fit those preconceived frames. And you have to be careful about, uh, with that, I think. Ironically, I think the Kodio history may well be described in very similar terms to the European Middle Ages. But that's more of a coincidence, because it has been this notion has been abused in the past so many times. Um, starting, for example, with the Marxist historians who learned as many things, but they also kind of distorted our views of history, um, trying to fit Korean patterns of development into Marxist patterns of development. That's not, not going to work. Look at North Korean historiography which, um, if anything, is a legitimation for the regime. It, there's not much real history there, historiography, I should say. Um, even taking into account well, that historiography may very well be wrong. I mean, I, whatever I say may very well be wrong, but I hope it's at least it's an attempt to truly clear up some of the things we don't know, arrive at a better understanding. Having said that, yes, um, I think there is a very good structural comparison to be made between the European Middle Ages and the Kodio, the Kodio period. Although I should probably limit that to um, before the Mongol invasions, because then things radically and really radically, dramatically change. For someone who might travel to Korea today, is the Goryeo era still visible? And if so, where? Are there any artifacts or structures that represent the Goryeo dynasty today? Um, if you travel to South Korea, you're going to be disappointed. There's not much left. Um, it's a story I always tell my students. My um, MA thesis in, here in Leiden um, was written about the Mongol invasions of Korea. And I'd heard that the palaces of the Kodio ruler, when once they moved the capital to Gangwado, the island um, near Seoul, um, were still there. So um, on this day, actually, March 1st, I went there, which was a very stupid mistake. I'll never make it again. Don't try to leave Seoul on the March 1st. <laughs> it was crowded, of course. In the 60 kilometers, it took me six hours to get there in a bus and I, I'm, I'm way too tall for buses like that I couldn't sit down I couldn't stand it was quite a difficult journey and I, I finally arrived and it, um, went to the, the place where the um, palace of the king uh, was said to be and I went there and I didn't see anything I saw grass I saw a few foundational stones that's it that was the Kodio period in and around Seoul um, now if you go to um, the National Museum you'll f they'll have pagodas real, and they rebuilt them but they are the original ones They'll have many Kodio artifacts, but in South Korea itself, there's not much left. Kodio dynasty built with wood, which is exquisitely beautiful, but it also is not very resistant to fires or war. And the Korean Peninsula, of course, has had its share of wars and devastation and everything. So there are just a few buildings in South Korea which are really undoubtedly from the Kodio period. Usually there are temples, like the Sudoksa in the, the southeast of uh, South Korea. On the other hand, if you go to North Korea, and I have to admit I've never been there, and I can't go, apparently this, the North Korean government is not very happy with me. The capital of Kodio, uh, Kaesong, is of course still there. There are efforts are being made to preserve as much as we can. Well, we, well, not me, but from Kaesong, or Kaegyong, as it used to be called, or uh, Songgyong. And there, there, there's much there. And it's not just there, it, it's, I presume that, there must be many more artifacts and buildings in North Korea than there, ever, than there are now in South Korea. Although, of course, the war also struck there. But still, um, Kaegyong and surroundings, there are really much to be found there, especially archaeologically. 
Yeah, if you go to South Korea, just read books, watch TV dramas. There's not much left. When we talk about Koryo, what do we actually talk about? What was Koryo? That seems like a very easily answered question, but in fact it isn't. That's one of the things I found out, although not all my colleagues agree, I, I have to admit, and which really surprised me is that in all the extant Koryo documents I've seen, the name Koryo is never used. Koryo, of course, the, the, the state was called Koryo. There's no doubt about that. Because if you look at official correspondence with foreign states, for example, or if you look at inscriptions, official inscriptions in, in stone, it talks about the Koryo state. That's definitely true. But it seems uh, as if this name wasn't very popular among the people itself. And even, even its uh, rulers, uh, not just the highest ruler, the king or the emperor, the son of heaven, or use all three, I guess, but also the literati, the intellectuals, uh, the, the officials. Sometimes they used the name Koryo, but more often they would use the name Samhan, the three Han, which is interesting because it's one of the first, I think, suggestions that Koryo had a um, pluralistic or plural historical lineage. It traced back its ancestry along three different lines of the three Han. And it also points to the fact that there was a population which identified itself with itself as something which had existed historically, but which existed before the Koryo state and society and would continue to exist after the Koryo state had perished. And this comes very close to the notion, I think, of what we today call a nation, something which is often the same as the state, but at the same time it isn't. By saying this, I think a conservative estimate, 80% of my colleagues would disagree, especially those who do study modern Korea. But still, I think, I think there's, there's a good argument to be made that Kodio was the first nation, the first coming into being of, of the community or two communities of Korea, of, of the contemporary Koreas. So when we talk about Koryo, that's, I think, what we talk about. The first coming together of a community with um, a very diverse, very rich and very not unified history, which slowly crystallized into a, um, a separate identity, an identity that was lost also. Even though I do think the historical continuity between Koryo and Joseon is very strong, and in many areas for 50 or 100 years after the founding of Joseon Dynasty, you can't really tell whether it's Koryo or Joseon you're looking at. At the same time, that really distinct Koryo identity, I think, was lost. But it was lost already during the Koryo state, the late Koryo period, probably. It's very difficult, really, to talk about Koryo, because I never know what I'm talking about when I talk about Koryo. So I try to use different terms. Samhan, which reflects the nation, which is a very self-reflective term also. Uh, and Kodio is really the state, the vehicle that deals with the tax collection, for example, with, with the foreign states, with things like that, things a state needs to do with the military. How did the name Kodio come about? Well, that at least is a fairly clear story, I think. The name Kodio is basically, it's, it's an abbreviation of Koguryo, the older state on the Korean peninsula, one of the three kingdoms, a Korean Manchurian kingdom, probably can't say that, but it's not purely Korean, it's a Korean Manchurian. And Koryo has always been seen as the successor state to Koguryo because they so obviously took its name. Well, they did, and there's no denying that. But as is reflected in the name Saman, they didn't just succeed to Koguryo. They also succeeded to Pekje and to, to Shila. But the thing was, at the time uh, of the founding of the Koryo dynasty, whether it was done by Kungye or by Wangon, it could very well be that the real um, founder of the Koryo dynasty uh, was Kungye, Although Wangon is the person who really, of course, um, made it what, it what it would become later. But that founder was faced really with a very simple choice. There was at that period a, um, a new state called Later Pekje. The Shila state was, still, uh, it was weak, much smaller than it used to be, but it was still there, Shila. So what are you going to do? There's only one state you can identify with, and that's Koguryo which is why they chose the name Koryo, I think. And also, if you look in Chinese sources, nine out of, that's probably too much, seven out of ten times, I think, Koguryo is not written as Koguryo, but it's written as Koryo. So it must have been a fairly normal and well-known name. And made sense, because the Koryo state of the 10th century came into being in the north of the peninsula, which is exactly the place where um, Koguryo used to rule as had Pekje and as had Shila, but let's just disregard that for the moment. Was the territory ruled over by the Koryo state similar to the one that is now covered by the two Korean states on the peninsula? 
that's a very interesting question. And um, when I set out um, with the research for my for my PhD, I was quite sure that the notion that uh, Korean territory, that the borders of what is now or what should be now a unified Korea, what are the two Koreas now, basically that that was a nationalist invention. That the notion that those borders had been stable for at least 500 years. Uh, I wasn't sure whether I believed it. I thought it was a nationalist interpretation of history. But when I looked into it, I found that, indeed, the nationalist historians had been wrong. That it wasn't true that those borders had been stable for 500 years. As far as I can determine, they have been pretty much stable for almost a thousand years. Which is quite remarkable. And I have to admit that you have to make a difference between the area the Kodio state claimed to rule and that it actually could always rule. In the north, Hamgyongdo part of that what is now North Korea was not always under its direct control because the Jurchen were there um, famous for many things but one of the things they were really famous for is that the fact that they didn't really like to be ruled by anyone but the Kodios had claimed it and no one else did and the more, more important thing is I think in the historical imagination of scholars of people this is the traditional Korean territory and that's, that's almost one-to-one -one correspondence with, uh, if you would put North and South Korea together today. And interestingly, you see, all, you see this also during the Chosen period, uh, for example, in uh, the Songs of Shamans, uh, in which they sing about the Korean territory. Just sometimes they even use the, the same kind of old-fashioned provinces as in the Kodio period in early Chosun. So the notion of territorial stability is really well developed on the Korean Peninsula and and on the one hand, the nationalist historians, I, I thought I disagree with, were wrong, but only because they were too conservative. I, I think you can make a case that the present Korean uh, territory, if, if we speak of a unified Korea, or put South and North Korea together, is very similar to Kodio uh, once it had stabilized its borders. Were there ever discussions of territorial expansion? Yes, there were, but not as much as I thought it would be. And as far as I've been able to determine, those discussions were mainly strategic. At least the discussions by serious people who uh, were serious administrators, uh, military leaders, people who knew what was going to happen, what will happen if you take an army into an unknown territory. That's not easy. And so in, in that sense, real serious discussion about territorial expansion beyond the borders of what we uh, see as traditional Korea almost nothing, with one big exception, the exception of Myochong, the rebellious monk, if he was a monk, geomancer, ritual specialist, I think I called him, who was sure that if Kodio wanted it, they could, it could conquer the, the Jin, the Jurchen uh, dynasty. The thing is, neither he nor any of his supporters, as far as I've been able to determine, had ever been abroad. They really didn't know what they were talking about. So then it's easy to talk about war. They'd never been in wars. It's easy to talk about vanquishing the Jin armies because they'd never actually seen any Jin armies. Um, but apart from those people, apart from Myochong, apart from that very, to a certain extent, anomalous period in Kodio history, although I probably have to be careful of saying this because it's also a treasured part of Kodio history for, for many Koreans, no, Kodio wasn't an expansionist state, which isn't to say they were inward looking. They were definitely outward looking, but they were much smarter than just focusing on territorial expansion. If Kodio expanded, and it did, I think, it expanded through trade. It expanded because it ruled the sea, not during its in the entirety of its existence, but the East Sea and also the Yellow Sea were pretty much the territory of, of Kodio based merchants who um, also had um, established outposts in China from where they, they conducted their trade. So I, I think it makes much, much more sense to see Kodio expansion in those terms, not in terms of territorial expansion. That, On the one hand, it's, it's horribly old-fashioned and at the same time very contemporary because it reflects our contemporary preoccupation with drawing the exact boundary between two states. And um, as you know, that's something that really occupies the South Korean government now. Where is the border? What, what is ours and what isn't? But it would not do, I think, projecting that onto the Kodio period. What preceded the Kodio dynasty? And in what way was the Kodio dynasty different from dynasties that came before? Great question. Um, I could think of a number of ways to try and answer this. First of all, um, if you want to um, stick to the definition of a dynasty, it's the ruling house. Uh, so the ruling house is, is different from, from the Shila ruling house, of unified Shila as it's usually called, in the sense that the Shila rulers were supposed to be Buddhas. 
they were really supposed to be incarnations of the Buddha. And of course, at, at a certain moment, especially when, when kings started being killed almost every year, assassinated and poisoned and everything, people didn't really take this very seriously, but the ideology was there. Kodio kings, or sons of heaven, or emperors, were never sacred or holy. They were different, they were better than you and me, they were better than everyone else, but they were not sacred human beings, they were not gods. Um, they were the representative of heaven on earth, they were the highest of the highest, um, sure. Um, but in those terms, they were, they, were, they were closer to other men, I guess. But that's that's just if you take dynasty very literally. Uh, and I think if, if we take it a bit broader, which I think is your intention, is the Kodio state and society also, right? How is that different from what came before? It's different in very many ways. It brought together notions of history, notions of culture, cultural practices, religious beliefs that hitherto had never been put together, not even by Sheila. Sheila was, of course, he didn't rule the north of the peninsula. Uh, I, I'm really curious, for example, what happened in Pyongyang all the time when Sheila ruled the peninsula. I have no idea. I know it was claimed by Sheila, but who was there? Who ruled it? No idea. Kodio, of course, ruled also the north of the peninsula, which is why I guess it's, it's no coincidence that the um, territorial boundaries of north and th south Korea today look so much like the state that Kodio put together. It was, I think, the first Korean state, the model for all the states that would follow. Choson, Taehan, uh, Jeguk, South and North Korea, and uh, who knows, a unified Korea in the future. Interestingly, it brought all these different languages and religions and, and cultural practices together because Sheila and Koguryo people didn't understand each other. Pekche, they probably understood each other, but still probably was a different language or at least a very different dialect. Uh, notions of looking at the world, uh, the way Pekche was Buddhist was very different from the way Shila was Buddhist, and Koguryo again very different. And all those nativist or indigenous practices that all the, and traditions that were particularly strong in Pekche and um, and Koguryo also in, in Shila, no, a bit different. Um, it it put them together and it didn't try to erase them, and that's that's the interesting thing about Koguryo for me. It means pure coincidence and luck that I ended up studying Kodio. I mean, if I had read another book during the period um, I think I was trying to decide what I was going to do, I probably would have ended up studying Choson or perhaps modern Korea, but I didn't end up studying Kodio. And that's so interesting because Kodio didn't try and put a stop to it. Well, Choson did. And they were pretty successful about it also. They really tried to have any everyone look in the same direction and think the same things. Well, that sounds too North Korean and it wasn't, but basically the chosen worldview was a unified worldview with one unifying principle for which everything emanated. No such thing, according to me at least, in Kodio. Very pluralist. It meant that you could trace your lineage as, as a family, as a person, back to different families. Uh, also to women, not just to men, which in Chosun you would never do. You couldn't even, because, well, you could probably, but you wouldn't. That's, I think, what, what made Kodio very different from what came before and what came after. The ability to let things that obviously were in contradiction with one another, things that were vague or ambiguous or inconsistent or that didn't make sense, to just leave them be. While I think most people in most periods and most places of the world... If you see a contradiction, if I see a contradiction, my first instinct is to solve it, to see what's wrong, right? I'm sure Kodio people would also do that in many instances, but at the same time, on a very, on a fairly fundamental ideological level, they let them be, which meant that in different situations they could choose to do very different things and still be feel connected to where they came from, which as a society is one of the most important things you can have because you become flexible and you can adapt to the most horrific things that happened to you, like the invasions of the Mongols, for example. Kodio survived. No one else did. And that's, I think, what made Kodio a fundamentally different society from what came before and after. How did Kodio legitimize its existence? Did it create new origin myth? Did it create a new sense of descendance? How did it do it? That's one of the most difficult things I think about Kodio history, and it's one I haven't fully come to grips with. So my easy way out now would to be would be to say I don't know, but of course I have some ideas, and I also should be honest about the fact that in general we don't know. There is no myth of origin in Kodio, which amazes me to no end. There is just no origin myth, uh, and in that sense there is no creation myth either in Korean history until very late. 15th century, I think, when you read something about how the universe was created. 
And the Tango myth, it's much, but it's not a creation myth. It's a myth of origin. And it's um, also not Kodio, I think, very late Kodio. And I've, I've never seen any suggestion, any kind of evidence that suggests to me that this predates um, its first mention, which is to the 13th century. So Kodio didn't really have a myth of origin. It had a myth of origin or a story of origin, an origin story for its ruling family. They came from the north. But that also is a very late, um, it has just written down in the 12th century. There's uh, three centuries after the family um, established Kodio, which may have something to do with the fact that the Liao, when they invaded, um, burned down all the archives, or and the Mongols did the same. This after it was recorded, by the way. But um, So we don't know. There is no myth of origin. I, I think the way Kodio legitimized itself most effectively it did it in very many different ways, which is the typical Kodio thing again, or at least that's what I think is a typical Kodio thing. It legitimized itself as a Chinese-style state with a, um, a king or sometimes an emperor or son of heaven, if the Chinese emperor is looking the other way, uh, heading the country. Uh, and if you look at the bureaucracy, it, at first sight, if you ask a Sinologist to look at the Kodio side, it will look very familiar. But then if that person would start reading, it would go like, well, this is not like in China, this is very different. And um, the words may be the same, but different meanings, different historical experiences. Uh, at the same time, Kodio also legitimized itself as a Manchurian state, as a successor state to Kogoryo, to Pare as a state related to Liao and Jin. It legitimized itself as the protector of the heritage of the Sam Han, which was encompassing notion which included the three kingdoms, the three later kingdoms, um, the, the Sam Han, so Ma Han, Pyon Han, Jin Han, um, and everything in between. It legitimized itself as a Buddhist country, as a Confucian country, as a nativist country. Just It really depends on who you ask and in what period and in what kind of social position these people find themselves. And most importantly, I think, and this is something in which I should do more research, but I haven't found the time to do so, the most important legitimation may very well have been the landscape. And this is something which has been overlooked. I think I'm the only one who ever wrote about it. Maybe that's because I'm completely wrong. It's, of course, a possibility that it's more than being a Confucian state, which it was, more than being a Buddhist society, which it also was, more than being a nativist nation, which, again, it also was. Everything seems to lead to, to the importance of the physical landscape, the, the role the, the, the mountains and the rivers played in the Kodio consciousness. The only thing I think Kodio scholars could successfully appeal to, in the end, when all has been said and done, if they wanted to win an argument, Buddhism, Confucianism, Nativism, Taoism, statism, could on, opp opportunism could only get you so far. But an appeal to the landscape would get you much farther. And what exactly this landscape was, and uh, that's something we I really need to look into, but I think that this is the repository, or at least of, of all the lived historical experiences. Because you see if when, when people travel in this time, and we only have the records, of course, of the, the well-to-do, people like E.Q. Bo, for example, or um, Kim Bushik, when they travel, wherever they go, they write about the history of that particular place and how that history fits in the contemporary situation. So it's it's a, a daily affirmation of what Kodio was. And by virtue of them being, of course, the rulers of the country also, they legitimize the state of affairs now. There used to be uh, a capital. This, this used to be, for example, in Chongju, the capital of Pekche once upon a time, but now it's part of our Kodio. It's much better this way, and then they would explain why. That's probably the most important way Kodio legitimized itself, through uh, its physical embodiment, its landscape, which is, of course, very self-referential, and I don't really know what to do with this, but maybe the next book will solve this once when I have time. How do modern Korean historians perceive the Kodio dynasty? It really depends um, who you ask, I think. Um, there are a number of very active historians who have really changed the way we think about Kodio. Their, their work has been outstanding, really. Um, and I think, in general, it's now accepted that Kodio was indeed a pluralist society, state. What that exactly means, that is very much debated. For some people, it basically means that there were different kind of ideologies and they didn't necessarily fight with one another. Uh, and for other people, in which I include myself, well, it's much more fundamental. It's a world way of looking at the world in which you consciously or unconsciously, and much, uh, probably a mixture of both, look past difficult things, contradictions. You just leave them be. 
and much also much old-fashioned historical work has also been done. We now um, have much better notion of what the sources are because we used to work with the Codio Sa and the Codio Sa Todio, the two main works, official histories of Codio, but they of course were written, compiled during the Chosun period, which brings a lot of problems with it. Doesn't mean you can't use them, but it means you're basically looking at a state through the eyes of a different society. Things like that we know now. We know how to, I hope, correct that balance. Well, we still don't have a critical edition of the Codiosa, which is amazing, with a lot of work, of course. But we do have translations, or the translation is not that important, but annotated translations into Korean. Uh, so we know its difficulties. And things like that, the field has enormously developed. But the one thing that, that kind of surprises me is that in history is, is very much alive in South Korea. It's most South Koreans, and I'm generalizing now, but they know much more about their own history than, mo than most Dutchmen. And it's, it's considered important. And if you bring an interpretation that goes against what is seen as, as, as normal or normative, I should say, um, you can end up in a very heated debate, which in itself is, I think, a good thing. And that's, in that sense, I'm happy to see that discussions about the Kodeo period, they still seem to escape the polarized environment that really plagues um, historiography uh, of other periods. Archaeology or the Three Kingdoms period, you can't write about it without making a political statement if you want to or not. Chosen period depends what exactly you write about. Modern, contemporary modern history, everything you write is a political statement. Um, and that's, that's severely, that's usually problematic, I think. Historians should do whatever they do which is right history. And of course, I'm being horribly naive now, but at least the ideal is that you keep politics out of it. Of course, you never do. Um, but if you don't, then you should be at least transparent about it. Um, and in, in Kodeo history, the field, it's still a healthy th field in that sense. I don't see many political battles being th fought there. But still, this is also a matter of perspective. The way I look at the Kodeo dynasty or states, Kodeo states, Kodeo history, is different from that of many scholars who work inside Korea, which makes for fun debates sometimes, sometimes for very difficult debates. Uh, for example, the, uh, the Ten Injunctions, which are usually regarded if you look, uh, as the spiritual constitution of, of the Kodeo state, society, dynasty, take your pick. I think if you look at any primary, uh, hist historical primer used in Korean schools, that's exactly what it will say the legacy of uh, Wangon, the, the founder of uh, Kodeo, I don't think they were. They were at least 100 years later. It's a forgery, which is not a very nice word. I mean, there is no nice word for this. I, I, I used the term creative deception. And it's actually it's a very good thing because it shows you how people also a thousand years ago used their own history to try and change their future and their present. To enlist the authority of a person who'd been dead for 100 years to come out of a very difficult situation, which at that time was Liao soldiers invading the country, a domestic system that didn't work, almost civil war. Was, I think the Kodeo dynasty escaped civil, civil war a few times, one time it didn't, and one of the times it did escape it was the early 11th century, which is exactly the time when all of a sudden somebody finds in the ruins of a burned down palace or his house uh, a copy of the Ten Injunctions. Hey, look what I found here. How come we never noticed this before? So that's, that's a forgery, and it's incredibly important in a very positive way as a forgery in Korean history. Until now, I think, most of my colleagues who work outside of Korea agree with me, if not all. I think inside of Korea, I think one person agrees with me, everyone else vehemently disagrees. And in itself, to be able to disagree and to talk about that is a sign of healthy academic discussion. The thing that stops me sometimes and that I don't particularly like is that these the lines seem to be drawn in terms of what kind of passport you have. And that's, I think, not a healthy situation, but at least there is debate, so that is good. And in general, I think Kodeo historiography has developed beyond recognition. And there, there's still not enough people working on it, I think, but many more than before. And the work that is being done is, is very high quality. The only thing is there's not enough in English still, because it's, and that makes it very difficult to access from, uh, from outside of Korea. You mentioned that Kodeo was pluralist. You also wrote that, and I quote, a state official who was in principle Confucian could also be a pious Buddhist who celebrated Taoist rituals, worshipped indigenous spirits and attached much significance to geomancy and other forms of divination. Does this mean that this pluralism was not just societal but also at the individual level? Yes, that's exactly what it means. 
And I wish my students would pick this up because sometimes they don't, or often they don't, I should say. So now you're completely right. That's exactly what it means. That's the interesting thing about cordial pluralism for me also, because when I started looking at it, and I didn't have a word for it uh, when I did start to look at it, I thought this was societal and that Kodil had found a more or less for a long time until Myojong at least, so 1135 or thereabouts, found a way to, to coexist where different groups could coexist, different beliefs. But then I, um, ironically, I started to look into one of the most important figures during that time of Kodil history at all, Kim Bushik, who is known now as this arch Confucian, very rigid China surfing, China centric person um, who did much to um, diminish the Korean nation. Probably slightly uh, exaggerating, but still, he is a Confucian scholar. And yes, of course, uh, we all know that he had a, a Buddhist temple in his uh, in his backyard, but still, he really, he was a Confucian. Now, I wonder whether he was. Well, no, that's no. Let me reformulate that. No, he was a Confucian. He truly was. A Confucian, and I think a revolutionary in that sense, the way he went about trying to reform the Kodio state. At the same time, I have no reason whatsoever to doubt what he wrote about his Buddhism. The fact that he, he died as a Buddhist monk, a lay monk, but he died as a Buddhist monk in his own temple. Um, he wrote the Taoist rituals that were performed at court. Uh, and although I think the whole episode with Myojong will probably left him with a bad taste in his mouth and a dislike for anything that had to do with geomancy at the same time he was also known to take that seriously if someone who is generally seen as the paragon of confusion virtue can be that complicated what would that do to all these all those other persons who were well less confusion or less prominent in their adherence of one particular kind of way of looking at the world i never know what to call this a system of thought a system of believing it's it's everything in, uh, put together probably um so social pluralism you see is mirrored to a certain extent in the individual yeah um kim Bushik is, is a very good example but there's so many other examples of, of literati because that's basically what we're left with documents sources talking about literati about scholars and, and most of them seem to have exhibited the same traits to the extent that those who were really just Confucian and they hated Buddhism, hated everything else, were mocked and ridiculed. They were not seen as being the norm. They were different. They were strange people who just believe in one thing. And of course, it is possible, and other scholars have done this and are still doing that. And it's, it's a legitimate way of reasoning, but I just don't agree with that. I don't buy it. It's seeing, uh, making a choice. So you have Kim Bushik, who was a Confucian. He said so himself. He wrote Confucian tracts. Who was a Buddhist also, who was also interested in nativism and Taoism. So what do you do with him? Well, you establish that he was a Confucian, for example, first and foremost. Everything else is hypocrisy. Or he died in the Buddhist temple, so that's where his heart lay. Everything else was either hypocrisy or just opportunism, which is possible. But I think in general, people don't work that way. Of course, we all are opportunists. We don't always hold to the beliefs we profess to believe. At the same time, I think it's very hard to function as a human being psychologically if you don't have certain notions you adhere to. And they, these notions may very well be um, contradictory. I find it very hard to imagine a human being who is completely consistent in everything he, he thinks and sees. You probably can be, but you have to make an effort. And I think in the Chosun period, we still have the same human beings. I don't think I don't think humans change, which is probably not a very good thing. But for me, a human being from I don't know human f a person from the Kodio period is very much interchangeable with you or me, except for of, of course our contextual knowledge and everything and experiences. So in the chosen period, you still have the same persons. What's the difference? The fact that it's no longer authorized or socially acceptable to show those conflicting notions and identities on the state level and on the individual level. They're still there. If you look close enough, they're still there. But you can't show them. And it's not desirable. And this is not a value judgment. Um, if I have to make a value judgment, I'll choose the Kodio dynasty. It seems like more fun. It's a very shaky foundation, I think, for making a value judgment, but anyway. But there's nothing wrong, of course, inherently, by not accepting that and embracing one guiding principle, which is what the choice that was made in Joseon, both personally and socially. So what role did the ruler of the Korea dynasty have in this context? I think the, if you talk about the role of the, the Korea ruler, um, you, you probably should 
use the plural, the roles of the Codio ruler uh, in this context, in these contexts, because there are different contexts. He was many things. Um, he was always a he. That's the one thing that doesn't change, and there's there's no diversity there. And the, the official ruler of Kodio was always a man. Before, there used to be women uh, rulers also, female rulers, but that tradition ends. In anything else, he was conflicted, <laughs> very ambiguous and contradictory and plural, because he was a king, which means that in the Chinese system, he was the ruler of a country, which was, practically speaking, independent from the suzerain country, which was, could either be China or Manchuria, so the Liao or the Jin, or the Song or the Dang. But formally speaking, he would have to bring tribute to the Son of Heaven, who was um, in either Manchuria or um, China. At the same time, he was also an emperor, which means you don't. there's no one above you. Same rank as the emperor in China, or the emperor in Manchuria. And then uh, he was the Son of Heaven. And this is really, really interesting, because if you look at the Kodiosa, it doesn't mention Son of Heaven. Almost never, maybe even never, I think. There are records of the, in the chosen period in which the people responsible for writing the Kodio says, or the history of Kodio, they were actually fighting with one another. They had these really, really fierce debates on whether or not to allow Kodio customs to be reflected in the Kodio Sa, or whether to correct them and make them proper. And they did, that's what they did. So the Kodio son of heaven became a Kodio king. This is easily done on paper, but if you're faced with, of course, with stone, steely uh, inscriptions, it's very, very difficult to change it. So if you look at those inscriptions, you actually see that Son of Heaven was a normal way to refer to the Kodio ruler. And this is important because king, emperor, you can quabble about that, but that's that's a level of human affairs. Prince, king, emperor, does it really make a difference? Of course it does to a certain extent, but the real difference is between anything else and Son of Heaven, because Son of Heaven is not, uh, you can't really find it in the, in the ranks of nobility. It's an uh, ontological position. It means that you are the chosen, the heaven-appointed representative of heaven on earth. It means that you have the mandate of heaven which is something the Chinese uh, emperors were supposed to have, and those in Manchuria also. So at a certain moment, you get this really weird situation in, uh, in Northeast Asia and East Asia, where you have three competing sons of heaven, and where the Liao son of heaven writes a letter to the Kodio son of heaven, basically going, well, dear fellow son of heaven, how have you been? This is what I would like to discuss with you. And that's, so that's one thing, that the Kodio ruler, in this sense, is all three in one. And not only when the others are not looking at him, that, oh, I can be an emperor, they're not looking at me, I can be a son of heaven, also when they are looking at him. Because we, are, we do have uh, sources which tell us of the displeasure of the, the Song Emperor with the way uh, Kodio, the Kodio ruler um, was treated or basically called himself. Then, within the country, of course, he was the foremost Buddhist. Uh, he was not an uh, incarnation of Buddha. That tradition also dies with Shila. He was also, I'm not sure whether other colleagues will agree, I don't think he was a Chakravartin or a Buddhist, an ideal Buddhist ruler. But he was the foremost Buddhist believer uh, who did special things for Buddhism, who protected Buddhism, who sponsored Buddhism. But he was a Buddhist believer, so which means that there were Buddhists in terms of Buddhism who were above him, the royal preceptor or the national preceptor. And there were um, uh, ceremonies in which he would take part, but he would not necessarily lead them. There were other ceremonies which he would lead as son of heaven. There were also Taoist ceremonies which he also would lead as Taoist, not sure what, what to call it, but as leader of the country. So he's a very multi-layered personality. Most importantly, I think he was the focal point of Kodio identity, because he embodied basically everything that you could be in Kodio. Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, nativism. He, he represented the country abroad. He represented the country within itself, within the, it, its boundaries. He was the um, ceremonially, symbolically, according to law, legally, the ruler of the country. Was he really the ruler? In the sense that he wasn't, he wasn't an absolute ruler. He had to share power with other people, with his ministers, with important aristocrats, with the Buddhists. Uh, and that's basically what a ruler is in Kodio. The first among his equals. And he has a, a unique position that no one can take from him. Not even uh, during the military revolt and the military rule period. They killed rulers. They did if they wanted to. But they always had a king slash emperor slash son of heaven in place. They never ruled in his stead. Not symbolically at least. Not ideologically. Practically, yes. So in that sense he was indispensable. Until the Mongols come and then everything changes. 
with what countries did Godio actually have relations with and how were those relations conducted? A very difficult question. And to a certain extent, it's easy. It had relations with its neighbors. Well, who are those neighbors? First and foremost, Manchuria. So that's the Kitan Liao, the Jurchen Chin. And the Jurchen, uh, we, I haven't mentioned the Jurchen yet, but they didn't have a state, which made it difficult perhaps to have formal relations. But if you look at the most active international partner of Kodio, it's the Jurchen, it's no one else. Then they have, of course, they had relations with China, with first Tang, then the Fu, the later Jin, then uh, most of the time the Song, until the Mongols at least. And that's the relationship that's always mentioned also in Chinese sources because the Kodio king accepted investiture from the Chinese uh, son of heaven so he was a vessel and Kodio was a basically a sinified country, state, society there is some truth in it but the key here is the word some some and not much more than that China has always been less important for Kodio than Manchuria and the way and the reason why we don't see that is because Kodio used Chinese uh, which kind of distorts the whole discourse because you're using Chinese terms, you're using Chinese concepts, Chinese frameworks. But we are, I hope, smart enough to be able to make that distinction. That you may use a language, doesn't mean you become that country. That would be like saying that um, I know the, the Swedes in the, mid- in the Middle Ages were actually Italians. Why? Because they used Latin. Uh, and they used the same framework. And they did at a certain moment. That doesn't make uh, the people who were Vikings just before, that doesn't turn them into some kind of Romans, right? Uh, something very similar, I think, with, with Kodio. If anything, they look towards the north. They always look towards the north. It's the most important partner, whether it's the Jurchen or the Kitan. If you look at the Kodio youth, their role models were the northern warriors, the mounted warriors. Um, and many a family was bankrupted because of the spending habits of these young men who would go off to war, at least with many expensive horses and and furs and everything so those are i think the the three most important trading partners or also exchange partners of 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 kodio the jurchen the manchurian dynasty whether that's the liao or the jin and the chinese dynasty the chinese states mainly sung Uh, then of course there's japan and that's one of the things that still puzzles me is that there doesn't seem to have been any kind of official relations between kodio and japan I'm not sure why not. Of course, Japan wasn't really unified at this time. I understand that, but still. So my assumption is that there was actually much trade going on. And I think if you look at uh, Japanese sources, that's what you'll see, but nothing really official. And of course, in coastal provinces, it means only 200 kilometers. And if the weather is nice, I mean, how long does it take you from Kimhe to, to, to Fukuoka? Not very long. Even in a sailing boat, even in a canoe, 180, 200 kilometers, it's very doable. So there must have been much interaction, but we don't know it. Uh, we'll have to wait for archaeologists to uh, to give us their conclusions, I think. Especially uh, uh, underwater archaeology. But Kodio had more extensive relations um, also with communities. I hesitate to word tribe because it's so colonial, the term. To the north, so more towards um, Tungus tribes or communities or Siberian contexts. Um, but also towards uh, Central Asia. Uh, we know that there were Arab merchants in Kodio. So it seems as in we don't have many sources that actually substantiate or that give us more detailed information. Kodio seems to have been a very active trading country. And given the, its position, I would expect it to have had very extensive contacts in Central Asia, which we know to a certain extent it did, but also uh, the Middle East and perhaps even Europe. But that's something that, that's just p- pure speculation because we don't have the sources to back that up. They don't exist or they don't exist anymore. I don't know. In the regional context of the time, was Kodio a big player? And how did it cope with the even more powerful players that were around? When I um, learned or studied Korean history, I think for the first time, but what I was always told is that Korea has always been this really small country, which was basically plagued by its excellent geopolitical um, position. And it had never been able to really stand up for itself. Despite that, it had been able to uh, form a a consistent historical identity and culture and everything, but it was never a big player. It was the the shrimp that was always caught between fighting whales. Well, if that's the case, Kodio is a pretty big shrimp, the kind of shrimp that that frightens whales. Uh, And there there are several arguments um, to be made in favor of Kodio actually being an active and important player in Northeast Asia, East Asia, or even beyond that, a narrow regional confine. The first kind of evidence I would like to suggest is the fact that Kodio and Korea still exist. That's not a given. 
Tibet isn't uh, an independent country anymore. Xinjiang isn't. Had Kodio been weaker, it would have been conquered by China or by Manchuria or by Japan. And it has been invaded many times, not as many times as is claimed, but it always was an important player in, in, in Northeast Asia. And if we just limit ourselves to the Kodio period, the one thing that always amazed me is the fact that Kodio withstood the Mongols for four decades. So the Mongols, who, if Genghis Khan hadn't died, probably would have ruled much of Europe. I mean, they, they came to Budapest, they came to uh, Vienna. So the Mongols, who um, conquered China, they, they conquered Central Asia. They didn't leave anything standing of certain Central Asian states. Russia, Polish armies, Hungarian armies, no one had a chance against the Mongols. No one. And who fought the Mongols for four decades? Korea. Kodio state managed to withstand the Mongols six invasions long for four decades, which is an incredible long period of time. And not only do they do that, they also managed to carve a Tripitaka, which is basically was supposed to be the entirety of everything that Mahayana Buddhism had produced in terms of writings. It's, it's uh, three baskets. Um, one is the, uh, the sutras, the sayings uh, of the Buddha directly. Then the sastra, the commentaries on what the Buddha said. And then the vinaya, or the rules for Buddhists and especially for monks. And this was a huge undertaking, you, uh, only undertaken by the biggest states. And it's usually a son of heaven who does this. Now, Kodio had done this before, uh, when the Liao invaded in the early 11th century. But then this Tripitaka was burned by the Mongols. So they thought, that's a very bad omen. Let's make another one. But this is not something which one monk does, uh, or two monks, or ten monks. You need thousands and thousands of people because you need to collect everything that has been written. And then you need to read it and decide whether it's worthy of inclusion into the Tripitaka. And then you need to edit it, and finally you need to carve it. And they did. They carved 80,000 woodblocks. They're still there in Hainza which is inc incredible. It's, and then in doing this while the Mongols are, are um, invading your country, that to me tells that Kodio was a pretty resilient country, strong also, which could take a hit. And hadn't that been the case, the Liao would have at a certain moment probably tried and invaded. The Jin also would have done the same. The Song, if you read Song sources, they fantasize about Kodio all the time. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually take it over because then we could invade Liao or we could invade Jin? Kodio was a big player. Was it the biggest player? No. It wasn't big enough to conquer Liao. It wasn't big enough to conquer Song. It was big enough not to be conquered by either of them and to be able, if Kodio would team with the Song or team with the Liao, it would be big enough to conquer the other one. And that's exactly what you find in Song sources. Liao sources, we don't have that many, but in Song sources, their biggest nightmare is a real alliance between Liao and Kodio because they know that they wouldn't be able to withstand a concerted attack. And, and of course, Kodio is not, Korea is not the biggest country in the world. Having said that, I'm from the Netherlands, so I should probably not say anything about size of the country. But Kodio had a, a navy that was internationally feared or respected. So the land-based power of Liao and the sea-based power of Kodio put them together, East Asian dominance. So I, I think we should see Kodio as a very important player. Not the biggest, but this, is, this isn't the contest who was the biggest, I think. But we should be finally be aware of how important and how strong Kodio was and how strong states in the Korean Peninsula always have been. The situation now is not an anomaly. Kodio, Choson, the three kingdoms in different ways because they weren't united yet, Kogurio, Pade, they always have played important roles. Not just in the region, but also internationally. And look at, look at Korea now. North Korea in a different way, but South Korea is a powerhouse, of course. That's something for which we actually can find... Well, there are previous examples of Korean Peninsula being this important in the world. You mentioned that there was trade with foreign countries, even from the Middle East. What was the position of foreigners in the Korean society at the time? That really depends. Um, the, the, the position of foreigners in Korea society, it, it really depends on the period you're, you're looking at. And it also depends on your definition of foreigners. We have to be very careful not to, to use modern uh, definitions, of course. And I think there were, there were plenty of foreigners in Kodio. I also think that this wasn't that much of an issue. It became an issue much, much, much later. Uh, and I'm talking about 19th, 18th, 19th century. And before that, hardly. 
the one thing it does tell me it it can't have been too problematic on a conceptual level to accept people who look different who eat different who speak a different language who probably smell different who do everything different into society I'm sure it wasn't easy but still conceptually it must have been possible and this is something which you see all through the Kodio dynasty until the Mongol uh, period of um, basically the Mongol colonization is that there are always groups of foreigners present and they're not very interesting unless they bring really nice stuff. So they're always Jurchen, they're always Kitan, they're Chinese, and then it's noted, of course, that these people are from abroad. They are Arab merchants, they are Japanese, and they seem to have been treated okay, but that's all I can say, because I've never seen anything else. There are some references to Jurchen killing one another, and then there's the question is how should you deal with them, because they killed their own people, they should be tried by their own people, you sanguinis, and that, that's about it. This changes dramatically during the, the period of Mongol rule in Kodio, because Kodio then all of a sudden is part of the largest contiguous land empire in the world. Of course, that, that empire, the Mongol Empire, falls apart in four different parts, but still, it's part of this really huge empire in which trading all of a sudden becomes so much more easy than it has ever been before, inter international trade. It becomes feasible to buy something in Venice and send it to Korea, for example. And then you see um, tens of difference of nationalities entering Kodio under Mongol tutelage, uh, and they become Kodio officials. And that's a very different different kind of society comes into being. There are Mongols, of course, but there are also Uyghurs, Uyghurs. There are Chinese, there are Japanese. There are, well, Japanese, not too many at this time, but there are Central Asians, all different kinds of Central Asians. There are Zogdians, there are Arabs, all different kinds of nationalities, and many of whom become part of Kodio ruling stratum. And also officially, not just because they're rich merchants, so you have to basically deal with them, you have to give them a voice. No, these people become Kodio officials. They are accepted as Kodio officials, which meant that they had to learn Korean probably, or Kodio and, or, and classical Chinese, but they did. And this is, um, I, I don't want to be um, too much of a preacher, and if you keep me talking for some amount of time, I always end up preaching somehow. But the one thing that has struck me, the one point in common between all states that prosper and they usually prosper because of trade, but also because of, of a proper management of what happens internally and externally, is that they're inclusive. That's the one thing. If you look at the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty also, but especially the Tang, if you look at Kodio, it's heyday. If you look at all the, all the empires that defined history, that basically created the world we have today, the Mongol Empire is the biggest example. The one thing they all allowed is if you're good enough, you are given the position that fits your talents. It doesn't really matter where you come from. It doesn't really matter what your background is. It's meritocracy. It's not a pure meritocracy because aristocracy, your family will always be important. Um, but it's this inclusiveness and that also characterizes Kodio in, in, in its heyday that makes it such a power to contend with. Same goes for Liao, same goes for Tang. It's, it's this notion that you can lose your foreignness you'll be different, maybe because you'll look different or you dress differently, but you can lose your the, your essential quality of being a foreigner. And that's, I think, a precious thing. We can, and that's also, I think, that's something that we've completely lost. Uh, whether I talk about the Netherlands or Korea, I think doesn't make a difference. If you're a foreigner, you'll stay a foreigner, unless... Well, there are always exceptions, but I think basically this is true. Uh, and this is one lesson to be learned from the past, that if you want to be, go anywhere as a state, as a society or as community don't want to limit to the state it's you need to you need to exhibit this fundamental flexibility in dealing with people end of uh, sermon <laughs> much of the discussion we've had so far concerned the first few centuries of the Goryeo era did early Goryeo's pluralism continue during the rest of the Goryeo era and when it ended why did it end that is actually a question I, I found most difficult to answer I don't think to be honest I answered this in my book but I don't know uh, why did it end? Did it end? Yes, I think I think it did end. Um, and I think it ended with what sh should have been pluralism's biggest victory, uh, the victory of Kim Bushik over Myochong. Uh, Myochong and his people who were very Kodio-centric, who admitted basically one notion, as the notion of Kodio at the center of everything. Uh, and that was the um, foundational base for, for their view on the world, for their value system. Well, Kim Bushik and people like him also, of course, helped by the international experience, were much broader and they were pluralist in the sense that they didn't allow one principle to determine their view of the world. 
And King Bushik defeated Myochung, or at least, well, not Myochung himself, he had been dead already by then, but his forces. Pluralism was reinstated, and really officially, because if you look at the Samguk Sagi, the book, the first extant history of Korea, really, written by or compiled by Kim Bushik, that's pluralism. And in its in its most obvious form, I think, I, I still can't imagine how you can read it as anything else than a pluralist testament, because it's... It's the Samguk Sagi, right? So the historical records of the three kingdoms. Um, and my translation usually is the, the histories of the three kingdoms, not one history, because there are three different histories of Kogudyo, Pekja, Shila, and then Unified Shila. So maybe it's four different histories. And if you look at those histories, they say different things. Sometimes the interpretation of one point is different in the different... And this is the same book, which should propagate the same view of history. This is the pluralist view of the world, of history, of Kodio, enshrined in the book, compiled by its most exalted, its most powerful, its most famous servant, Kim Bushik. And then it stops, somehow. And the only reason I can think of, well, that's not true. There are two reasons. One is internal, one is external. Internal, this doesn't bode very well for us humans, I think, for the condition humaine, because we always seem to gravitate towards wanting certainty, one principle, wanting clarity, transparency. And historically, I think this is what you find in most societies. There's also, of course, the the urge to have something different, but it's usually marginalized and minor. And Kodio is an exception in, this, in the sense that it actually codified the bandwidth of, of diff- things that were possible, different things, contradictions and, and inconsistencies and everything. But I think the normal state of affairs for, for most people is not that kind of pluralist state, but a more a monist state, in which there maybe the world as we see it, yes, it's contradictory and it's ambiguous and there are lots of inconsistencies, but they shouldn't be there. We have to solve them. And that's where we have to go, all of us. And that's what Chosen was like. That's what most states are like. That's what the Christian states in, in Europe in the same time were like. We know it's not a perfect world, but we're going to get there. It's, it's basically it's utopianism. Uh, which is one of the most dangerous things I think humanity has ever kind of invented, the notion of utopia. Not the notion that things can get better, but the notion that things can get perfect, which is what Chosun was like. Of course, much blood was shed in Chosun also, then again also in Kodio. Um, so that's one thing why I think Kodio pluralism ended, because in the end, I think it's not the most natural, it's not the default position for human societies. And if enough things go wrong, you start to lose the ability to deal with trouble. And Kodio got its, its amount of trouble. Uh, first, it got uh, the, the military revolt in which Kim Bushik's son was killed. Then, during the military rule, the Mongols invaded. The military rulers were overthrown. The rule was re- authority was given back to the Kodio rulers, who were now kings, no longer emperors, no longer sons of heaven. And the authority they really received was minor. I mean, this Kodio was now part of the Mongol Empire, and I think this was a colonial situation. And um, I I know my colleagues in Korea don't agree uh, with this assessment. Uh, I just had a discussion uh, this summer with some of them, and the main uh, criticism was that colony is is a modern modern concept. Well, I don't think it is. I mean, the Greeks came up with it uh, a long time ago. But even uh, if it had been a modern concept, I think Kodio came up with something and the Mongols with something very, very similar. Anyway, that's the other reason. That's the external reason why this society no longer um, was pluralist. First of all, internally, it had started to fail. It had started to show the basically disadvantages of, of pluralism. It has many advantages, but it also has disadvantages because you don't choose. Many things are possible, which must freak out some people, <laughs> I can imagine at least, especially in social context. And the other thing is during the Mongol Empire, one of the big things that was really, really attractive to Kodio scholars, the people who made the country, who, who did everything, who made all the decisions, was Neo-Confucianism. And that's a Neo-Confucianism is much, but it isn't pluralist. It's very monist. It's, but it's one principle upon which everything else is based. It's this one way of looking at life, at, at the world. At, and that's uh, when I said before, your question about legitimacy, I said the landscape was so important and all the historical recollections and experiences that were tied to the landscape in writings, in songs, but also sometimes really inscribed in the landscapes and inscriptions. What you see during the Mongol period is, is astounding. These new intellectuals, because they are the sons of the old intellectuals, but they look at the world completely different. They no longer refer to Kodio's old history. 
they now look at the same piece of at the same you know, rock at the same mountain they don't celebrate its history within the Kodeo community they celebrate its history as a mountain as a concept uh, as a thing in itself which is a very new Confucian thing to do and it's 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 not a Kodeo thing and that's the, that's the external reason for for pluralism to basically disappear and I think if you look at the Samguk Yusa so the the historical remnants or, or the memorability of the three kingdoms we're finishing a translation of it in English and we still have to decide on the title it's usually seen as the beginning of a new consciousness a new Korean nation comes into being a Korean nation that defines itself against the Mongols I think it's completely wrong then you really haven't uh, either you didn't read the work or you didn't you don't know anything about uh, the context it's exactly the opposite I think there was a Korean nation a Koryo nation before and that Koryo nation ceased to exist or it morphed into something very different because there is historical continuity and it morphed into something Choson society in the end but first Mongol Koryo society and the Samguk Yusa if one thing it's a celebration of the historicism of all the historical layers of Koryo and it's the last work of its kind and then nothing um, so it disappears and we, we can still find it in, in writings but pluralism as such as a mainstream notion disappears and it, I mean it still exists in, in, in Choson but it exists in each and any society has its pluralism it, usually we don't admit it and IS even I'm sure if you look closely enough has its pluralism has its divergences but they of course more than anyone wouldn't like to admit it and Chosun's literati also wouldn't really admit it although they would be a bit more relaxed about it but so yeah now to 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 brief to 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 summarize the pluralism codified by the state and carried really by society it really disappears and all that's left is the kind of pluralism we all know as human beings in every kind of society professor Remco Brueker thank you so much for your time it's a real pleasure, Alan, to do this. Um, also, because I think you are the, uh, by by far the most well pre- prepared interviewer I've I've, <laughs> I've ever met. So it's a, a real pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.